Glad that you guys are joining us. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the campus pastor here at our Aurora campus. Uh, man, we just love our online community. And one of the reasons why is because you can watch us from anywhere. Maybe you're here in Colorado, in the United States, or maybe even across uh, the ocean. Uh, man, we're just so glad that you're here. Would you leave us a comment down below? Let us know uh, where you're watching from. And hey, if you are local, I'm standing in our lobby at our Aurora campus. We have five Five locations across the Denver metro area in Lafayette, Longmont, Denver, Aurora, and West. Uh, we would love to see you at one of our physical locations. So come check us out. We would love to see you in person. And hey, would you do this for us? Would you share this video? Man, if you love what's happening here, if you're impacted in any way by today's service, uh, would you share and like this video? And if you haven't already, uh, would you subscribe to our YouTube page? We would love to stay connected with you as God continues to do amazing things here at Flatirons. Hey, we love you. So glad that you're here. Enjoy today's service.
church. Is it a good Sunday morning to be in church? Come on. Hey, I'm Carl. I'm one of the pastors around here. Go ahead and grab a quick seat. Just got a couple of announcements for you. Man, we are so hyped about what God's doing around here at Flatirons Community Church. Last week, across all five of our campuses, we had 1,050 people step into the baptism waters and say yes to Jesus. Come on, that never gets old. And it was such an awesome weekend for me as a dad because the week before, I'm in the lobby talking to another dad and we were both, we're gonna baptize our daughters and we're both like, oh my gosh, how do we do this? How do we do this? And then it was so cool after service, we're both soaking wet, hugging, just celebrating what God had done in the lives of our kids. And that's not just because of our work, but that's because of the work of our amazing children workers back in children's ministry every week, preparing our kids, speaking the word of God to them. Would you guys give it up for all of our kids ministry workers? Love those people, man. And it doesn't end there. We had over 220 middle schoolers and high schoolers say yes to Jesus and get baptized last, last week. I'm telling you, the next generation's on fire here at Flatirons. And if you want to get your son, your daughter, your niece, nephew involved in our student ministries, I would implore you, get them to rally this week. It's a once-a-month gathering where we bring all of our students together, and they hear an amazing message. They engage in some great worship and just have some time together. Our student team's out in the lobby. They'd love to give you more information about getting your son or daughter hooked up with Rally. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, Carl, there's a lot of stuff going on here at Flatirons. Yes, there is. And whether last week was your first week or you've been around for a while, we want to help you get connected. So right after service, just head to Discover. It's out in the lobby, just past uh, the info table. A couple of our staff members will be there, some volunteers. We just want to help you take whatever your next step is in your faith journey. So come by and say hey, hey to us. I'll be back there. I'd love to chat with you. We're in beginning a very awesome series today, and we're going to get into that just a little bit. But let's worship a little more together. So would you stand to your feet and let's worship.
scripture tells us that the name of Jesus is above every other name, all powers, all dominions, over everything on heaven and on earth. The mere mention of Jesus' name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so today we're gonna invite you, we're gonna challenge you to lean in and to speak his name over your life, over your family, over your job, over your mind. If nothing else, just to remind you that he's with you, remind yourself that he's with you, and that the mere mention of his name can change the atmosphere. So let's sing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know
speak his name. so grateful for that truth today that Jesus name is above every other name above all powers all dominions on heaven and on earth God thank you for sending Jesus in our direction to die in our place so that we could be in a relationship with you God you're so good to us you're so faithful God if we don't feel those things today would you just remind us that you're with us and that it's okay to show up exactly how we are because you see us I thank you for that today, Lord. I thank you that you are close, that you are closer than the air that we breathe. So would you allow us, would you help us to rest in your presence today, knowing that your presence is enough, that your presence is the prize, God, and we don't need or want anything else from you in this moment. God, we love you, we trust you. You are so worthy of our worship. So today we glorify you, we give you all of the praise, all of the glory and the honor this morning. Thank you for a place to come and worship you, to remind ourselves of who you are and to rest in that truth and in your presence. God, we love you, we trust you, we give you this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy and mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, if you're grateful for the presence of God, will you just clap your hands this morning? We are so glad that you guys are here, that you're with us. Before you sit down, would you say hi to the people around you that you did not show up here with this morning? Tell them you're glad to see them. Shake some hands. And you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, if you're joining us online, we are so grateful that you're here and that you're a part of our church. Yeah. Wow. Anybody need that song? Yeah. Um, we're going to... Aaron, go ahead and play. We're gonna go off script here. Um, I'm, I don't think we're done. Um, the, just, just, some of us need his name to be power in our life today. And some of us need some healing and some of us need some strongholds. I, so uh, this is gonna sound weird, but it's me. Uh, like, I, I, I've been praying something for a long time, and I got a little bit of an answer this week. Um, anybody going through a, a stretch of hard road? Like, not, not a day, not a bad day, like months. Like, it's been going, yeah, me, me too. And I, and I was praying earlier this week, going, I don't, I don't know how much longer I can do this. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, uh, and he gave me just enough to keep going. Anybody need just enough? You don't, I don't need it all fixed. I don't need it all healed. I don't need it all delivered. I mean, I'd like that to happen. That'd be awesome by Tuesday, Lord, if possible. Right? Um, but so far, that answer has been no. My grace is sufficient for you, though, right? And so, um, uh, this is unplanned. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, let's just pray, okay? Um, so, God, for anybody listening to my voice right now that's like my brother and sister going through a, a dark tunnel right now and going, I don't. I, I don't wanna be in this tunnel. I, I just need some light in my life. Will you right now just give them enough to not give up, to not quit, to not just say, you know, I'm out. And no one really blame them because it's been going on for a long time, but if we didn't have you, um, uh, if we didn't have you, but we have you, <laughs> right? Um, and your name is power in our weakness and your name is healing in our brokenness and you set us free from these strongholds that have their chains around us, you, your, your blood does that. And, and I, I guess I just needed just to start before we even get into anything we might do in the future, just thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, because we couldn't make it without you. And maybe that's the only reason we drug ourselves into rooms like this this week, uh, today, is just because we just needed to know you're still with us. Um, in a crazy world. So God, will you just give us enough to just keep on going, that we're not alone, that, that you're with us and we're gonna learn today that you're not just with us, you're in us, and we're gonna be all right. Um, so I just speak Jesus into every dark shadow that surrounds us today. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray, 
Amen. Amen? All right, I hope that was all right. Okay, uh, if it's not, go to another church. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that guy back there like that. Um, anyway. Hey, I'm, I'm, uh, t- today we're gonna kick off a new series. It's eight weeks long. It's gonna take us all the way to June 1st, all right? I think it's the perfect follow-up series to Easter and very timely in the, in the life of our church, meaning that over the past several months, um, We've had literally uh, like record numbers, like hundreds and hundreds of new people, new families coming to, to one of our campuses to check out the whole Jesus faith journey, many of them for the very first time. And then on Easter, we saw over 1,000 people baptized, which just blows my mind. 250 students were, were baptized. And let me just take the online I- audience, because I know people, have, people are listening around the world. Um, if you baptized in a hot tub last week or a, a bathtub or, I don't know, ran through the sprinkler, I don't, I don't know. It counts, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, but send us those stories because we wanna, we wanna celebrate that with you. And, and I, love what, I love how we're approaching baptism because uh, baptism for me was just like, I feel really bad about my past and maybe this will help. That's, that's what I was baptized. But it's now, we see it as something stronger than that. It's a declaration of allegiance to Jesus. He's our Lord, he's our King, he's our Savior. He's the one who saved us and he's the one that said we could be with him. Um, I, I, got, I got a couple great text messages this week uh, from, from listeners. Across. Well, I got one from... Uh, from Cambodia, we rescued 10 more girls this week, all right, and eight of them were little kids, all right, so, so I, my goal is to say that every time I get up here is that there's, there's, there's some girls that are free. Um, I got this one, um, uh, and I was gonna keep it anonymous, but I'm not good at that, so, uh, and, and I have permission from this family, but, so I got this one, hi Jim, uh, first, happy Easter, second, my 23 year old son, uh, who is living in Denver, this, this guy lives on the other side of the country, whom we've been praying for for years, his older brother, Josh, see, or some name, I don't know if it's Josh or not, um, <laughs> invited him to uh, one of your campuses this past weekend. And then the dad sent me the screenshot of what his son uh, sent him. He says, hey dad, so um, I didn't plan or expect this when I woke up this morning, but Josh baptized me. And I can't do the last line. Um, the man on the middle cross said I could come. Isn't that amazing? Um, <laughs> So, so across our campuses, those two young men are at one of our campuses right now, I'm not sure which, but will you really encourage them and just say welcome to the family of God? Will you just do that? And it's so good. And my phone's on silence because I know some of my friends will call my phone. Anyway, so, um, but all these new people and people you know, following Jesus, that means we have a whole bunch of people who have taken some first steps in their faith journey and, and, and here's what the follow-up question is, now what do I do? Now, now what? And I'll, I'll be honest, there's some of us, we've been on this faith journey for a while, like decades, some of us, all right? And while we know we're saved, um, I think I could describe a lot of our Christian life right now as like, I feel stuck. I even feel kind of lost in my journey, like, like where is this thing going? And on a bad day, am I making any progress with my walk with Jesus? And even on a really, really bad day, is, is it even worth it? There's other ways to live your life. So if that's you or, 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 or you know someone who any of that describes, uh, this is gonna be one of the most helpful, practical series on what you're gonna need to keep on going. The Bible uses the phrase, enduring to the end. Like, don't give up, don't, don't, don't quit. And, and to describe this Christian life and journey, especially when the road leads you, and this is what's gonna happen if you're new to this faith thing, it's gonna lead you into new territory that you've never experienced before, and you're gonna look around and go, I don't know what to do now, all right? Now, 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 usually when I start a new series, I spend some time kind of explaining the metaphor, or, or, or the, uh, the Bible word would be a parable. I'm gonna compare uh, something here in this world with something that Jesus is gonna teach us spiritually, and I usually start with that, but I'm gonna save that to the end of today. But first, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna pick up right where we left off on Easter. We're gonna look at what happened right after Jesus has risen from the dead, and then right before and right after he ascends back to his Father. If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, we're gonna be in Acts chapter one and two primarily today. Uh, so go ahead and find that. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all right? It stands for Acts of the very first Christians, all right? But, but we're gonna pick up the story about six weeks after Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to a whole bunch of people. He's appeared to the disciples. Uh, a guy named Paul writes in, a, in a, a book of the Bible called First Corinthians that one time Jesus appeared to a crowd of 500 people at once. So he's not like sneaking around. People are seeing him risen from the dead. And so we're gonna pick up the story. Jesus has a smaller gathering now of his 12 disciples minus Judas who committed suicide, all right? Uh, they, they go outside of the city of Jerusalem to this place called the Mount of Olives. It's the same place, the same garden where he'd been arrested a few weeks ago and then, and then crucified. So he takes them out on top of this mountain and, and Jesus gives them this command, Acts chapter one, he says, 
And while, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. I told you about this promise. For John baptized with water, like in the Jordan River, remember that? But you will be baptized with or in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking, earthly kingdom, we're gonna kick Rome's butt and we're gonna take over the world, all right? And we'll, you'll be president, we'll be vice president. That's, that's what they're thinking still, all right? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And this is really important. But you will receive, what's the word? If you have your Bible, I'd underline that word. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, that's the other provinces of Israel, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, which, I, yeah, be like, wow, there he goes, right, all right? But while they were still looking up in heaven, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So let's unpack that. Here's the final directive from Jesus to his disciples. First thing, stay here, stay in Jerusalem, all right? Because God is about to keep his promise, I told you about this, all right? To baptize you, not just with water, but with or in the, the Holy Spirit. We're gonna talk about that, all right? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll receive power and you'll be able to do things that you could not do without the Holy Spirit in you, all right? You're gonna use this power to bear witness, to testify, to teach, all right? Uh, everything I've taught you, uh, about Jesus, who he is and all that he has done. It will start in Jerusalem, and then it'll spread throughout Israel and eventually to the entire earth. All right, Ma Matthew, he records the same scene. Uh, it's called the Great Commission. Go to all the nations. Take Jesus to all the nations, and just for the record, he will come again. I will come again, all right? Now hold on to that, because we needed a little review from, from last fall. Now, now most people, uh, most Christians anyway, when we think about what the Messiah, like the Christ, is gonna do when he got here, and we know that's Jesus now, we, we all, most of us, jump right to what we celebrated last weekend. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin and then defeated death by rising from the dead, validating who he is and what he's promised, and that would be right. So if you're thinking, why did Jesus come? That's a, good, that's, that's a great answer, all right? So Jesus reversed the curse of death that came upon all of us way back in chapter three of the Bible, Eden, okay? But if you were to ask a Jewish person, we've talked about this, right? Living in the years leading up to the arrival of Jesus, what the Messiah, when he came, what he would need to do, they would have agreed with you, the Messiah will have to remove the condemnation of sin, but he's gonna do more than that. Remember, there's three missions he came to, to, to do, right, right? They knew that also the Messiah would also reverse the curse of the depravity of man, Genesis chapter six, where our hearts and our minds were broken inside because we live in a broken world and we're continually fixed on evil. We don't try to think about evil, we just do, all right? But the Messiah would make transformation and confirmation of our hearts and minds to be more in line with God. But it's not through Bible rules, it's not through laws and do this and don't do that. Jesus says the Messiah, He'll put his own spirit in us, changing us from the inside out. Rules try to change you from the outside in. It doesn't work, all right? The third thing the Messiah would do, and this usually gets kind of overlooked or skipped over, or like, I don't know what that even means. The Messiah would regather the nations that were scattered back at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. He would bring them back from all over the, the planet, right? And he would form a new kingdom. This is when Jesus says, I'm gonna form a kingdom this is what he's talking about, right? We saw Jesus accomplish the reversal of the curse of death and sin. We saw that last weekend on Easter. We're about to, today, we're gonna see Jesus deliver on the second promise of the Holy Spirit, and he's gonna initiate the beginning of the third promise, regathering the nations. Now, just before Jesus ascends back to heaven, he tells them, don't leave, okay? Stay in Jerusalem until God sends you his own Holy Spirit. He promised, right? And, and they have no idea what that means, okay, right? So they go back to Jerusalem, they, they replace Judas with a guy named Matthias, all right? Then they go upstairs, they find a room in a house in the city, and they hide. All right, they hide, why, all right? Because they, they, they had just seen Jesus risen from the dead, and that's, that's really good, but he just left. It's like, no, no, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. And then there, there, there he goes. And even though Jesus had made him a promise, something good was about to happen, was on the way, it hadn't happened yet. 
You ever hear a promise from God and you're going, I, have, I believe it's gonna happen, but it hadn't happened yet, so lock the door, right? That's kind of where they, they are. They just sit, sit and they just wait for God to deliver, right? So let's pick up the story. It's now time for the Jewish feast day uh, called the Day of Pentecost, all right? Acts chapter two is where we're gonna be. The day of Pentecost celebrates two things. The giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses after they had left Egypt on the way to the Promised Land. And Pentecost also celebrates the first grain harvest of the year. And it happens 50 days, Penta, right? 50 days after Passover, which happened a few weeks back uh, when Jesus brings all of his disciples and they have the, the, the bread and the, and the cup and the, the Passover meal, right? right? So Pentecost is a big deal in the Jewish faith. Okay, still is today, right? And people from all over, Jewish people from all over the world, from where? All over the world, that's really, really important. You're gonna go, oh yeah, it is important, right? They would come to Jerusalem for this special holiday. It's really, really, really important, okay? Acts chapter two, here we go. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, the disciples, were all together in one place. Yeah, hiding, that's what they were doing, okay? And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided, this is so amazing, right? And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all, what's the word? Filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Is everybody following this, okay? Jesus said, wait, they waited. The day of Pentecost arrives, they're all sitting in the house and suddenly the sound of a rushing wind fills the entire house, all right? By the way, the word for wind and spirit is the Greek word pneuma, it's the same word, all right? But, but apparently there's this loud sound and people outside, we're gonna find out, they hear it too. And then what looks like tongues of fire come and rest on each one of them, which that's gonna get your attention, all right? And fire is always a symbol of the spirit of God or the presence of God. And each disciple was filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning this. This, this, this is so important, right? The Spirit wasn't just in the room with them, he was now in them. And they began to speak in other languages, all right? So file this away, because I'll probably violate it on accident, right? The Holy Spirit is a he, not an it, right? He is part of the Trinity, right? We're familiar with God the Father and God the, or God the Son. The Spirit is just, ah, it's kinda weird. We just sang about him. We just asked him to fill the room. Right, but we have no idea. Well, what if he did? Most of us go like, run, all right? It was like the eclipse, that's what's gonna happen. All right, here we go, so anyway. Now listen, I'm not gonna go, <laughs> I just thought of that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going down this rabbit trail of did, did they start babbling in some you know, tongue, some spiritual language that only angels understood? And I'm certainly not saying that if a person really, truly, authentically is filled with the Holy Spirit, then they have to speak in some angelic you know, tongue as proof the Holy Spirit's in them. I hope that's not true, because I've never done it. I've never like done it. And if you have, good for you, but maybe I'm not a Christian. I don't know, but I, I, I don't. <laughs> it's not a litmus test for being a Christian. It just happened there. But Jesus said he was going to send the Holy Spirit, right? Why? Why? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, first he says when a person receives and is filled up with the Holy Spirit of Christ, right, that, that Spirit will give that person the power and ability to do what they could not do if the Holy Spirit didn't live inside of them. Second, all right, the Holy Spirit, he will make it possible for a person, all right, to take the message of Jesus Christ to places on the earth where the gospel has not been, been, been taught yet. So look what happens right after this, okay? Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, where, where are they from? The whole planet, why? Because it's Pentecost. And they'd all come from all over the known world for this big thing, all right? The, the ends of the earth. And at this, at this sound, the multitude came. So they heard it, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them, the disciples, speak in his own language. So the, so the 12 disciples, they leave that house, all right? They go to a large area, a, a big courtyard located right outside the Jewish temple. I was there two years ago, all right, on the steps where this happens, all right? There's this big crowd going, what's that noise? And they start preaching, they start witnessing about Jesus. And either, and I don't know which one is true, but, but either, they were able to speak in the languages of all the foreigners who had come to Jerusalem, or the Spirit did something between the mouths of the disciples and the ears of the foreigners, but everybody heard the message of Jesus in their own language. Either one's pretty mind-blowing, right? right? And do you know what the response of the crowd was? These guys are drunk. You can read this right there in chapter two, right? These guys are sewn out of their mind, right? And so Peter stands up and he goes, may I have your attention? We're not drunk. It's 9 a.m., some of you going, well, oh, there's a spring break or two where, oh, okay, good for you, we're listening, right. But I want you, in the same spot, right, Peter, think about Peter, right? In the same spot that 51 days ago from this moment, 
in the same spot where he denied even knowing Jesus three times. A little girl asked him, he goes, I don't even know her, get away from me, right? Jesus preached, or Peter preaches the very first gospel sermon, and this is how he lands the sermon. Look at this, this is so convicting. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And they're like, oh, you remember Jesus? He's the son of God. You killed the son of God. Way to go, all right? So, and this is the response. They were, they were cut to the heart, I bet. We killed God, all right? Um, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, so from now on, the disciples are sometimes called apostles. Brothers, what shall we do? I mean, we killed the son of God. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And right after this, 3,000 people got baptized. And that was probably 3,000 of the men, uh, but then some of their wives probably did and some of their kids probably did, right? Now, now, a couple things we saw right there that fulfill what the Messiah would do and Jesus promised it would happen, okay? First of all, Jesus said that he would send his spirit and his spirit would change hearts and minds and give a person a, power, a new power and a new ability that they didn't used to have. So here's what I want you to think about what we just saw. I want you to think about Peter, okay? Peter was in the best small group ever. So well, mine's pretty good. It's not as good as Peter's, okay? Uh, he had the best small group Bible study leader in the history of ever, all right? What do you mean? Jesus, okay? Like, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you like to have Jesus be your Bible study leader? So could you explain creation? Oh yeah, here's what I did. Yeah, I mean, it'd be so great, right? Peter had a ringside seat to every one of the teachings from Jesus. He was right there. Uh, every miracle, he saw it happen. Peter's the other guy that walked on water for a little bit, right? Nobody had a better chance to become a really true, great disciple of Jesus more than Peter. But in the darkest, scariest moment, about six weeks ago, we find out Peter hadn't changed at all. He's a coward. He denied knowing Jesus three times. Hear this, all right? Knowledge about Jesus and even some emotional church experience cannot change a person on the inside for long. I mean, I get you all whipped up, you know, emotionally, something like that, but it won't last. Take, you might wanna take a picture of this. This thing's pretty good. Listen. The physical presence of Jesus with Peter hadn't changed Peter's life. The Holy Spirit of Jesus in Peter is what changed Peter's life. You see the difference there? Because we all go like, I just want, if Jesus was to go to school with me, I would get in so less trouble. I would drive better, you know, if Jesus was like, you might want to slow down. I mean, we, we just, right? But Jesus said, it's actually better that I live in you, my spirit lives in you, than to be with you. Physically, right? So Peter's life wasn't changed by good, a good sermon or an emotional experience. Peter's life was changed when the Holy Spirit moved into him, filled him, and changed him from the inside out. Some of his life changed right away. He had boldness and courage that he was hiding in a room a few hours ago, right? And some of his life changed over time. And for what reason? So that Peter could take the message of Jesus, starting right there in the temple courts in Jerusalem, and then onto the entire world. Now, now, now get that, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nerd out for a while. I love nerd now, okay? And some of you are going like, I don't care about this part. Okay, you should. Anyway, I, I didn't even see this until I started last year working my way through the first 11 chapters of the Bible. The first 11 chapters of the Bible is what the rest of the Bible is based on. It really, really is, okay? So again, I'm gonna nerd out, and if you don't like this, that's okay. Just go get some coffee, all right? If you were to go back in your Bible later today, go to Genesis chapter 10. Don't do it yet, right? right? The chapter right before God scatters the nations at the Tower of Babel. Remember that whole story, right? You will find in chapter 10 a list of, a, they call it the table of nations that trace all the, 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 the nations that trace their ancestry back to Noah's family after the flood. And there are 70 nations there. 70, that's a big number in the Bible, right? So 70 nations are scattered after Babel across the planet in Genesis 11. And then in Genesis 12, God tells Abraham that his descendant, Jesus, would not only bless all the scattered nations of the earth, but his descendant, again, Jesus, would regather the 70 nations into a new spiritual kingdom and Jesus would be their one true king. Now, here's where it gets so cool, all right? If you skip, go, skip, go back to Acts chapter two, okay? This is the crowd a list of the crowd listening to Peter preach. Look at this. How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And I'm gonna slaughter these names. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya and belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now in the past, when I've seen lists like that, I just call that skip over parts. 
Like blah, 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 blah. Same with the, the whole genealogy. Gave birth to someone, gave birth to someone. Like, I don't care, blah, blah, blah. And then you get down as hard, right? Until you realize that what we just read there in Acts chapter two, it's the same list as Genesis 10. Right, under the umbrella of those listed groups at Pentecost, every one of the 70 nations of Genesis 10 can be found except one. And that, that nation is called Tarshish. We now call it Spain, which is why all through the book of Romans, Paul goes, I've got to get to Spain before they execute me. I have to go, right? And, and it, kind of there's a debate on whether he made it or not. Why does he need to get to Spain? Because the regathering of the nations began at Pentecost and Spain didn't show up. So I need to get the gospel to that end of the earth. And he, his whole life's goal was, was to get in there. Now here's why this is so important. Right now is why it's important, okay? And how this new series is gonna address something very, very important in our lives, all right? If you go back to Acts chapter two, Peter has just preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who, who come from being scattered all over the earth. They'd come to the city. They hear the gospel, they're cut to their heart. They ask Peter, Peter, what are we gonna do? Like, like how can we be saved? And Peter replies to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the, into the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins will be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people did that. And the Holy Spirit moved into them and they, again, they were cut to the heart, they repented, they confessed, they put their faith in Jesus, they were baptized, their sins are forgiven, and now they have the Spirit of Jesus living in them. The same Holy Spirit that lived in, in the apostles, the same Holy Spirit that lives in us. So right after that scene, do you know what happens next? Don't read ahead. The Jewish holiday of Pentecost is over and they all go home, right? They all, they, they come from the ends of the earth. They didn't all move to Jerusalem. Let's all go up to the upper room and we'll just live there and maybe tongues of fire will get, no, 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 no. They went home. Home to what? To a country, to a town, to a family, to a job, to a school that nobody had any idea. Nobody even cared who Jesus was who he claimed to be or what he had promised, blah, 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 keep it to yourself, right? But if you keep reading through the book of Acts, and, the, and we're gonna do that for the rest of, of the summer, right? Over the years as Peter, and later a guy named Paul, and Barnabas, and Timothy, all these people, right? They traveled all over the known world. They would come to a town, and they'd never been there before, and they would find Christians there, right? Sometimes there's one or two, sometimes it's a little church that had kind of you know, formed there, right? And so, so, so some of the men and women who became believers back at Pentecost, they went home and they took Jesus with them. How can you say that? Because his spirit was in them. And he, Jesus, started to spread to Rome, to Athens, to Egypt, to Syria, and eventually to the ends of the earth, and eventually made it to Colorado. Which is why if you're a Christian today in Colorado, it's because somehow that message didn't die out or fade away because there was a really great church service at Pentecost one day. How, how did it make it here? How, how, how is it possible? I mean, over the centuries, right, Christians have faced huge persecutions. I think more is on the way, by the way, that their faith was declared illegal. Like many Christians over in history in the last 2,000 years have been hunted down, imprisoned, tortured, executed, yet Christianity continued not to just make it, not just to stay alive barely, but to thrive. Like the harder the persecution, the harder the circumstances that Christians find themselves in, the more it spreads. And we're seeing the same phenomena played out right now. Like China has more Christians than America, right? Uh, 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 Africa has more Christians than North America and South America combined, I, I believe. We're seeing it in Afghanistan where Christians risk their lives every time they open a Bible or they meet together. It's spreading like wildfire. So what, 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 what kept it or is keeping it from being squashed out and forgotten like so many other religious faith systems that are long gone that we excavate and go, I wonder what they worshiped. But Christianity's still around. Well, let's look, at, let's look at us, okay, all right? Let, let, let me talk to those of us who call ourselves Christians. And I say this, the majority of the room, and if that's not you, just file this away in case you ever decide, I, I think I'm gonna do this, all right? There was a moment, I want you to remember, there was a moment when you first heard the message of Jesus Christ and it clicked. Maybe you'd heard it 30 times before, but there's that one time, remember? And you were like, I actually believe this stuff. Maybe it was last weekend at Easter or, or maybe it's decades ago and in that moment in faith, you, you kind of sat there or drove home, whatever that, and you had a vision for what you believed your life was gonna look like based on what Jesus had said and what he was offering and what he was promising. Right? You, like, like Jesus and me, like, like I have a vision, I have a hope, I have an idea, I have plans for what, what, what this new life with Jesus is gonna look like. And I think this is where he's gonna take me. 
Remember that? Remember that? How excited you are, right? And, and you started great. I, I started great, all right, right? But over time, life or reality just kind of set in. And, and just like those people in the Bible story, some of you, a thousand of you got baptized last week, right? You went home to some really awkward conversations, right? You went home to a family, to some jobs. Uh, you're gonna go to school th this week. You're gonna, you're gonna get together with your buddies or whatever, and they don't care. They're not interested in your faith in Jesus. Like, just keep that to yourself. And, and over time, out, out there, trying to figure it out alone, over the last few weeks, months, years, whatever, it's just kind of faded, hasn't it? It's kind of faded into a really nice, comforting thought about what comes after you die. Right? I, I, I'm not dead yet. That's Monty Python. I'm not dead yet. Uh, but after I, thank you, but after I die, I'll get out of here and it'll get better which doesn't really match up with the life that Jesus said he came to give us, right? This is what Jesus said. He said this, he said, I came, Jesus said he came, that, that they, they would be us, may have life and have it what? Abundantly, like overflowing, right? right? Jesus said that he came so we could have an experience, an abundant, overflowing, like, I mean, it's, it's just, it just keeps spilling over, it's so, it's so full. And it's from the moment you put your faith in Jesus and then it lasts on to eternity. But abundant life is present tense, not just future tense. It's not, our faith is not an after I die life. It starts now. See, to me, an abundant life is more than, I don't know, it's better than nothing, I'm, I'm not dead. I don't think that Jesus said, hey, come follow me and I'll show you the way to a life that people would describe as, well, I'm not dead. I mean, this afternoon, if you call somebody on the phone and go, hey, how are you doing? They go, well, I'm not dead yet. You'd probably hang up and dial 911. He's not doing well, right? I mean, speaking for myself, I, I believe that Jesus is promising more than a life that's just not dead. It's just what we settle for. Later, a guy named Paul, he writes, he says, he describes following Jesus as a life that is truly life, meaning there are lives out there that aren't really life, right? And I'm not talking about a problem-free life, uh, problem life or uh, an easy life. I mean, in this world, you all have trouble. Right? The person who said that, they crucified, so he knows what he's talking I'm talking about a life that is abundant and full of joy and peace, even when, not if, even when hard times hit your life, like some of us have been in a season for a while. Can you have joy in the middle of that? Jesus said it's very possible. You can have an abundant life even though this world tries to strip everything joyful out of your life. Do we believe that? So let's do a quick review of our life, okay? Um, we, we, had, we started what? We had a vision for what Jesus was gonna do in our lives and we walked out of church or wherever it is that we kinda had that moment with Jesus and we had every good intention of pursuing the Christian life. But, but it didn't really happen or it hasn't happened the way we thought it would happen. So what happened? What's missing? And I would say strategy. You had a vision and you intended to pursue it but you didn't have a plan. You didn't have a strategy. Uh, Okay, for that vision to become a reality in my life, I probably gonna, I need to do this, and need to do this, and, and next I probably need to do this, all right? But you didn't have a plan. So nothing really changed, or is changing, or it can be described as alive or abundant. It's more like, you know, I'm not dead yet, but after I die, I'm gonna live again. But it feels like a matter of time until you tap out and you look for something else to give you hope. Anybody there sometimes? I, I am, all right, all right, so. Okay, I'm gonna take a really hard turn here. All right, let's talk about this series, this metaphor over the next seven weeks. Okay, so over the, over the last several years, Robin and I, my wife Robin and I, we've become obsessed with survival shows. All right, where the contestants are dropped off in a remote place or jungle or desert for like a certain amount of time. And for, for several years, Robin and I, we, we did not miss one episode of Naked and Afraid. It's, it's almost creepy. I, I, was, I always thought it'd be cool, let's watch it naked, and she was afraid. So we didn't do it, but. <laughs> That's a good joke anyway, but anyway. Our current, let's move, let's move our current favorite outdoor, outdoor survival show is called Alone. Has anybody seen it? It's so good, and if, if you don't see it, you, should, it's, you can get it, okay? So in this, in this competition, I'm gonna talk about it for a minute, and it's a metaphor for where we're going, okay? 10 people are separately dropped off in remote areas, I think Canada, right? And, and while in some survival shows, the contestants know how long they're gonna be out there, usually like 21 days or 40 days, but not in Alone. All right, in alone you're out there until you're the last one left and you don't have contact with anybody else. At any point you have a radio and you can say, okay, I'm done, I'm done. I'm hungry, I'm injured, I'm sick. I just don't wanna do this anymore and I wanna go home, 
come pick me up. But you won't know if you win until the producers come out and tell you everybody else quit, so you're the winner. You don't know how long that's gonna be. You can go out there for a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, all right? Um, currently, the longest time that someone was out there before being declared the, the, the winner is 100 days. All right, I know, they're made out of something different than me, all right? And alone, each person is allowed to bring with them a certain number of items that they believe will help them to not just survive, but to thrive. Like, I'm not gonna just go out there and just not die. I, I, can, I can stay here forever, okay? They're, they're not allowed to bring food, obviously, they have to find their own food. They're not be able to bring a, a firearm or anything like that, but they're supplied with a camera, some batteries to record their experience, and a radio to call for medical help or to tap out. That's all they have. The rest is in their bag. Now, it's said that a person, I've studied this, a lot of survival shows, you can go three weeks without food, three days without water, three minutes without air. And what, what, what that means is all those three things are important. They're not equally important. Some things are more important and more urgent, okay? I'll get air in three weeks. No, you won't, okay? You need that first, right? So when the contestants are picking out which eight to 10 items they're gonna bring with them, they know they better choose wisely because once they're out there, that's, that's it. Right, this is all they have to rely on because they're on their own, they're alone. Now if you watch the, the, the show, most of the, almost all the competitors prioritize the same three items, right? They, they need a fire to stay warm, so fire starter, right? And to boil water, and that's number two, they need a water source, right? And the third, they need to build some kind of shelter. After that, it get, contestants get really creative in what they bring and that they believe will help them, not, again, not just to not die, but to survive and to thrive and endure to the end and be the winner. Some people bring an ax, they bring a machete, they bring a fishing net, they bring some rope. These are the things that I believe that I will need so that when everybody else quits, I'm still going. I'm enduring to the end, I'm winning. So I wanna use that show alone as a metaphor or a parable, so we're gonna call this series Alive, okay? And the idea is this, just like those very first Christians back in the book of Acts, they had to go home to a really remote place where they were pretty much on their own, it was just them. Right, they were the only Christians in their town, in their home, in their family, and just like a lot of us, we're on the front end of starting our walk with Jesus. It feels very similar to that. I'm kind of going into the unknown, and it feels like a wilderness, and I'm not sure what to do out here. The question is, what is it gonna take for us to not, just not die and give up, but to experience what Jesus says is possible? You can live an abundant life in the hardest circumstance. So what are the eight to 10 items that we must have in our spiritual, mental, emotional backpack that we can access to face and overcome anything that we might encounter out there uh, in the unknown? I mean, because it's gonna get cold, right? And we're gonna get really, really hungry. And then there's predators out there that wanna take us out. They wanna eat us, <laughs> right, right? If we wanna experience a life that is truly alive in Christ, and I would say that's most, I want, I want that, right? What's that gonna take? It's not gonna happen on accident. So each, each week we're gonna have a backpack up here, right? And we're gonna pull out a different item out of this backpack and let it symbolize a spiritual truth or discipline or reality that you must have with you if you have any hope of making it to the finish line and you don't know how long that'll be. Um, some of us might see Jesus later today. God bless you, all right, right? Some of us, gonna be, it's gonna be 50 years from now, all right? Then each week what we're, when we're done, you're gonna be given an assignment. This is gonna be very, very practical, uh, interactive, all right? You'll receive an instruction card. So you should have received an instruction card when you came in, all right? Find that right now. If you forgot, um, I think there's some stacked on the camera things here, and uh, there's on your chairs, or raise your hand, I got people in the back that will bring one to you. Just leave it, so come, come down here, with some people, all right? You're gonna need this, all right? So you're gonna, we're gonna fill this out. You're gonna put into a, a, a practice a new spiritual survival discipline which will help you thrive out there in the wilderness. You're gonna get a new card e every week, all right? So just reach in that lady's purse and get a pen. She doesn't mind. Go ahead, all right? So, so today is week one, all right? So go ahead and get out your card that you received or right, when you came in, all right? And so uh, here's, my, here's my first item. And it's a compass. Okay, compass gives me direction. Where, 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 where am I going? Right, because I can get lost out there. And I want this compass, if you look on your card there, um, there's three words, vision, intent, strategy. All right? Now in the show, all right, uh, the, the Alone Show, all right, at some point, the contestant gets really, really, really in their head and they put the camera there and they explain their why. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I out there? Like, why am I putting myself through this? What, what, what they hope a successful outcome will be if they win. Someone going like, it's a half a million dollars. That would change my family forever, right? Other people go, you know, I wanna overcome some stuff in my past, uh, and I wanna prove to myself or other people that I'm, I'm different. 
I have what it takes. But bottom line, there is a why statement for each contestant that answers a huge question. If I win, ready? It means my life might look like that. So in your vision, let's just call that your guiding vision statement. My goal, my win, my why am I doing this statement? So here's what I want you to do right now. And here's the thing is, right? I want you to take this home. You're probably gonna scratch it out and go, I don't want that. I want this. And then you're gonna scratch that one out. And you're gonna, and you're gonna come out, uh, uh, why are you doing this Jesus thing? And all right, other than you wanna go to heaven after you're dead, okay? But wh what's the point? All right, in one sentence, what is your vision for your life with Jesus. I'll give you some examples, all right? Like, I, I just wanna know Jesus, like, intimately. Like, be friends. Like, 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 Jesus said, this is eternal life, John 17. This is eternal life that you know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I, wanna, I, I, I would love to intimately know, I intimately know Robin. We don't have any secrets I, I know of, all right? I, I want that with me and Jesus. I wanna have peace. I just wanna have peace. I wanna know my life is Counts, it's significant. I, I, wanna, I, here's a, I wanna know God's will for my life and I wanna live it out. Again, besides heaven after you die, why are we doing this? Why are we pursuing discipleship, apprenticeship, whatever you wanna call it, following Jesus in this life? What kind of life are you hoping following Jesus will lead to? That's what I'm with you under vision. This is, this, is where, this is my destination right here, okay? Next, you see the word intent there. You see, you're gonna have to scratch it out because you're gonna change your mind a whole bunch because you're just doing song lyrics right now. He's amazing, great, you know, whatever, okay. Good for you, let's dig a little more, okay? Most of us have never articulated this, by the way. It's like, why are you a Christian? Uh, it's personal, which means you don't know, okay? But so let's go to intent. What would be true or present in your life if that vision was a reality in your life. Like if you and Jesus were like, we are tight, we are intimate, right? We're living life together like every day. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, I would know what Jesus defines as true. I would know what Jesus says is right and wrong, right? I would know, I would obey what Jesus says to do because it's very, very clear what he's telling me to do. How about this? I would, if I really trusted Jesus, if we were really tight, I would trust Jesus even if I don't currently understand why he's telling me to do what I'm doing. I'm gonna trust him more than my emotions. Because right now, my emotions run my life, but I'm, if, the, if my vision statement was true, my, my emotions would not run my life, he would. I would treat people the way Jesus would treat people. I would look in the mirror and I would agree w with God on how he sees me. So what kind of words would describe your life, all right, if that vision statement, the destination of your life, was a daily reality to be living out in your life, okay? How about this? If, if Jesus and you were tight, like you really say you, that's the destination, what, would, uh, what wouldn't be present? Like maybe I wouldn't be addicted to this anymore. If Jesus and I really had that kind of relationship, maybe you know, we wouldn't fight about the same things in, anymore. Uh, um, what habits, what addictions would, would be broken because he breaks every stronghold and you get that out of a relationship with him, all right? Just write down some, maybe my life would look like this because of that vision, all right? Finally, you have a vision and you know why you're following Jesus and you have an intent, you know what your life, you hope would look like if it were true, but I'm just saying, if you just stop there, it doesn't mean crap, sorry. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a pipe dream. It's just wishful thinking, okay? Unless you have a strategy. Like, what is it gonna take to see that vision and those really, they're very good intentions, uh, very noble, right? What's it gonna take for it to become a reality? So under strategy, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down the first thing that comes to mind, like right away. Like, you don't have to think, don't pray about it or anything. Like, I know I need to do this, okay? I, I, I need to do what? What's, a, what's one thing that's just really clear? I need to start doing that. Stop doing that, I, I don't know. In alone, like, before you go on the show, they all do this, I, I started practicing making a fire without matches, because I figured I'd need that down the road, right? I, I, I know how to purify water, I know how to build a shelter out of sticks, all right? So what do you need to do, or learn to do, that you don't currently know how to do, all right? So if you want your vision to become a reality. And that's what the next seven weeks are gonna be about. Very, very, very practical. All right, what we're gonna see, all right, and me and some other teachers, we're gonna get up here, uh, we're gonna pull things out of this backpack. You're, you're gonna need to understand, here's what, where we're going in the next couple weeks, right? You're gonna need to understand the Holy Spirit's role in your life. Most of us know about God the Father and Jesus the Son, and Jesus said the presence of the Holy Spirit in you is better than Jesus walking around life with you, which just blows my mind. I would just rather him like, stay close, buddy, right, right? Um, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will be your power source, and without him, you're gonna get slaughtered. But 
Like we sang a song about Holy Spirit, you know, fill me, all right. What does that even mean? And how do you tap into that? And do you start rolling around on the ground and flopping and speaking in other languages if it happens? Like, that's spooky, all right, all right. Um, What does it mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and do things that you couldn't do without him? I don't know. If you're gonna apprentice yourself to Jesus, like a disciple, what kinds of things did he say were true about you, about her, about them? What kind of things did he say? What did he say was important? Because it's, it's all found right here. So we don't have to guess what Jesus said. And again, each week we're gonna unpack another piece of survival gear and the must-haves that you must have because you're gonna get really tired and you're gonna get hurt. Anybody been hurt by Christians or the church? Jesus never hurt you, but life did, right? And you're gonna get really tired and you're gonna tap out. That's what I was praying about earlier this week. Now here's, I'm done, but we're gonna take communion together, right? So weaving through all of this, we will, will be the why behind the why. Like, why, why are we even doing this? Why are we meeting together? And why are we following Jesus? And why are we, you know, why, why, why do we do this? And here's, here's why it's all made possible. Because the man on the middle cross said we could. And he said we could be with him. Well, don't I have to do all those eight things? No, 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 no. No, you just have to trust him, all right? How about this? This is why we're following Jesus. Because for God so loved the world that he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son. If you put just a little bit of faith, how much? I don't know, the thief on the cross, he got in. You will not perish, you will not be condemned, you will not have punishment, you'll have eternal life. This is eternal life, that you know God and his son Jesus Christ. Why, why am I running after Jesus? Because he loves me like no other. He died for me, he rose again, and now he makes this kind of life possible because I know me and without him, I'm out, right? And Jesus knew that, he knew life's gonna get, they had no idea, right? You have no idea what, what's about to hit you all, so here's what I want you to do. And at that Passover meal, 51 days before the scene we looked at today, he, he took the, the normal Jewish feast, and he goes, okay, take the bread, okay, everybody take a piece of bread. Now this bread represents that bread that they baked right when they left Egypt, so unleavened bread, right? It also represents manna that he fed him in the wilderness, and he says, but from now on, it's gonna represent me, my body. And again, they don't know what he's talking about. And then he took wine, he poured it out, and this, this is gonna represent, um, it's, wine represents all kinds of things. It's gonna represent my blood, because when you shed blood, it cuts a new deal, a new covenant, and from now on, I'm your God, I'm your king, I'm your savior, I'm your Messiah, and you're with me. Well, how, well, how do I get in? I told you you could come. Just put your faith and trust in me. So we're gonna do that right now. Uh, we're gonna take communion. Um, if you're new to Flatirons going, am I allowed to take communion? Do you believe Jesus is the Christ as best as you understand? That he's your Lord and Savior, he's God with flesh on, he died on a cross for you. Otherwise, you have to die for your own stuff, all right? But when you put your faith on him, what he did counts for you. And then he defeats death. Just like what comes after our funeral, we, we will not die. I talked to somebody that said, I lost my, I lost my wife and I think my son, and I'm talking to Ron out there in the lobby, and he goes, oh, I bet there's a party in heaven. We have parties waiting on us. We have hope waiting on us. But we don't have to wait for our funeral to experience that. Eternal life begins now, right? So if you feel comfortable, you, they're gonna pass it up and down uh, the aisle. We're gonna, we're gonna sing this great song, and it says the, 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 the believers who came before us, they, they Sing praise to God. And the believers who come after us, they will sing praise to God. But you know what the link is to the believers in the past and the believers in the future? Us. There is no future if we tap out. We gotta keep going, right? So do not give up, do not quit. Endure to the end. I'm gonna pray, we're gonna sing, communion will be passed. Stand whenever you wanna stand and then we'll, we'll, we'll be done, all right? Man, I love y'all, so good. God, you're so good. Um, of course I wanna follow you. Who else loves me like you do? Who else can I trust more than you? Who else wants good for me? Who doesn't want anything from me except a relationship, except faith? Who else will walk through the valley of the shadow of, of death with me when everybody else says it's too scary? Who else will never give up on me when everybody else says 
I'm done. Only you, there's none like you. So we take a little piece of bread and, uh, and a little cup of juice, and it, this doesn't save us, it reminds us that we are saved in our darkest tunnel moments, that you're still here, that we get to be with you because of how good you are. That's why we worship you. And so as we take this Lord's Supper together, sitting at a table with you, um, we worship you. In Jesus' wonderful name, I pray, amen.
love you guys. Thank you for showing up today. Make sure you check out Discover in our lobby to get connected around here. We have a prayer team up front that would love to pray with you. Otherwise, have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you back here next week.